Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 815. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelegi, speaking from Jerusalem on August the 8th, 2023. Welcome to another episode. We're glad you could join us. We have a special guest here with us, David Ligley, who's the uh, rector at Christ Church in Jerusalem. But before we get too far, this is a great opportunity to ask you to subscribe to the program to like the program if you're on YouTube or Facebook, share the program whether you like us or not, especially with friend and foe. David, welcome to the show. How are you doing this week? Well, um, thank you very much. I've uh, just returned a few days ago, taking uh, a study tour, most many Anglicans, to, uh, to Poland. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a very long and exhausting and fruitful time. So I'm recovering from that. Yeah, it's been it's about a three hour time difference between uh, Poland and Jerusalem, uh, and you spent it was it two weeks there, virtually uh, two weeks. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. So welcome back, and uh, you and I have been trying to arrange a time to do an interview about what's happening in Jerusalem and in Israel uh, since mm-hmm. January, uh, because politics being what they are, and the location of Israel in the Middle East kind of makes what's happening there happen everywhere it's attention it's it's uh pungent it's on unten- it's untenable and we need to talk about it because this is the the motherland of christianity the motherland of judaism and it it, it serves an important spark and an important interest to all of us that it survives now I, to, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court of Israel. Before we do that, people may not know this, but Israel does not have a constitution like America has. That's Israel correct. has something called basic laws. That's and um, so part of the problem or the tension is you don't have a central document that you've looked back on for hundreds of years as a place and a source where your laws and understanding of your country belong you 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 know you were restructured in uh, 1948 and it's been a little strange intense since then because you have enemies on all borders and politics are what politics are david exactly we um have uh, some uh, huge challenges here first of all we have a, a, a population uh, mainly of immigrants and uh, 95% of them came from countries that had no democratic tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, and the you might say, and the the emergency of uh, setting up uh, Israel, the Jewish state, the um, political tensions and uh, the circumstances uh, mitigated against uh, a constitution, uh, a bill of rights. We have a political system. Uh, that was adopted largely uh, from British bureaucracy and from a Polish par- parliamentary system that existed at one time uh, before the war, the Second World War, and uh, 1939. And in some cases, um, these institutions and practices have served the country well. Uh, however, they are in need of uh, some sort of reform and uh, we're in desperate need of a constitution and uh, something similar uh, to a Bill of Rights. So I think Americans uh, should rejoice in the fact that we have uh, a constitution, we have a Bill of Rights, uh, we have a long uh, democratic tradition. And uh, of course, uh, as an American living overseas, I would uh, urge folks to, to be very careful about either trashing the system or um, in any way trying to destroy it uh, and, and our frustrations. It's too slow, it doesn't work. Uh, I think all many of us here in Israel uh, would love to see uh, this, uh, this country imitate some of what we have in the U.S. Well, one of the things we have in the U.S. is called the balance of powers. The legislation, mm-hmm. legislative, executive, and um, uh, judicial branches balance mm-hmm. each other out 
times, right? Mm-hmm. In most times, okay. It, it, in mm-hmm. the good times, there's a, a good balance of power. You don't have that in Israel either. We don't. We have a, a very weak um, parliament. We have a very strong. Um, we have a very strong, usually a very strong prime minister, and an administrative uh, administrative state. Uh, we have again no uh, exact. We really don't have a bill of rights. We don't have a constitution. Um, the only thing that the only institution that provides uh, checks and balances uh, on uh, the government itself uh, is the the court system. And uh, here, Kevin, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just um, put a, a word of caution into many of our many of your listeners, well, I can say our listeners, because I, oh, I yeah, listen to <laughs> no, it's not your, not my program, um, is especially for American conservatives. And uh, I have all sorts of sympathy for American conservatism, as long as it's not uh, cheap populism. But oftentimes Americans, who uh, American Christians, American conservatives, they come to Israel and they bring their paradigm and they bring their issues uh, from the United States, and they bring them here to Israel. And uh, the situation here is a little bit different. So, for example, in the United States, we might argue that we have a bit too much in, uh, inclusivity, or there might be uh, an abuse of uh, tolerance, uh, or that racism, uh, the charge of racism, is uh, being perhaps abused and used in a, a, a malicious political way. But here we really don't have enough tolerance. And here we could use more inclusivity. And here we do have a problem with racism, although I should warn that um, it's not necessarily apartheid, but it is racism. Oh, no. but, and, yeah. and, and, and we, we, we need to deal with these issues. And uh, I think folks from abroad who might be struggling uh, with uh, progressives in their own country need to be careful about transferring their issues and, uh, you know, putting them on the local situation here. I think America is unique that it was created on an idea more than on the powder keg it was going to become Mm -hmm. with people coming from all parts of the country to be here. Every other country is uh, formed by the people who were there first. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's one of the strange dichotomies that America offers. It's it's based on an idea, and that idea may survive much longer, and it may fold because we forgot that idea, we forgot what we were founded on, and the same in Israel. I see. I see that you guys are kind of forgetting, you know, what you were founded about. Well, not exactly. We th- that's the problem. The problem uh, actually is inherent. Um, and I can give you uh, maybe one one good example. Sure. <clears throat> Theodore Herzl, uh, in eight in the spring of eighteen ninety six, published a book, and he called the book in German "Der Judenstadt." Uh, now, how do you translate "Der Judenstadt"? It can be translated as "the Jewish state" or "the state of the Jews." Now, what is Israel? Is Israel a Jewish state that is going to be run according to? Jewish law or Jewish tradition or Jewish precedent, or is it a state of the Jews, meaning many Jews with uh, perhaps uh, different understandings that, uh, uh, that are not traditional, or Jews who might be uh, co- religiously conservative yet not orthodox, um, Jews that might be liberal or leftist or even atheist, and see that you might say uh, conundrum uh, has never really been solved. What kind of Jewish country uh, should Israel be? Should it just reflect the state of the Jews of the world, or should it uh, aim to be something uh, traditional, biblical, uh, or more? How would you define Zionist in this then? Zionism, even though it's a term that has a, a bad word, Zionism is, uh, is really very simple. Zionism simply says that uh, the Jews are a distinct ethnic slash religious group, 
and that they have the right and even the need for a piece of territory uh, in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Today, however, the word Zionism is thrown around and you know, uh, dragged through the mud. To be a Zionist is to be some kind of extremist or to be uh, a racist or to somehow hate Arabs or to want to impose apartheid. Um, you could be a cultural Zionist. You could be an economic Zionist. You can be a Zionist and say, well, Israel, the state of Israel or the Jewish state should only exist in a parking lot uh, in Tel Aviv. You can also be a, a Zionist that uh, wants a large empire uh, in the Holy Land. So it is very, very broad. It's like saying, I'm a capitalist. Well, what, what kind of capitalist are you? Uh, or what kind of uh, Republican might you be? So we have to be careful not to, uh, to abuse these terms. There are certain types of Zionist thought and Zionist practice that are, you might say, very healthy and inspiring. And there are certain types of Zionist practice that, uh, uh, to be honest with you, is quite ugly and even dangerous. So Now, we're here talking mostly because of the, some changes that have been proposed about the Supreme Court um, mm -hmm. by your current leadership. And mm -hmm. why don't you just kind of lay that out for us? Well... The um, the the right wing in Israel um, has always, uh, in recent years, felt constrained by the court. This is the political right, together with um, their orthodox, uh, ultra orthodox, and uh, orthodox uh, allies, and uh, they've always felt that the court has too much power and has too much power to strike down uh, laws made by the, uh, the parliament or uh, decrees um, uh, you, imposed by the government. And that is, to some extent, it's true. The court does here have a, have a, so a lot of broad power, and the broad power is um, based on what the critics say are are precedents that uh, can be quite flimsy. And they want to reform the court system and therefore limit uh, the power of the court, especially what's known as the reasonable clause, the, uh, the court uh, taking uh, British precedent uh, and can at times um, strike down uh, or to um, turn back government decisions that do, do not uh, appear to be quote unquote reasonable. Now, the courts never really abused that, but at times it's been quite necessary. And for those who might uh, be legal scholars, uh, they will certainly suggest, well, this is opening some kind of uh, Pandora's box, uh, for example. But on the other hand, uh, again, with a very weak parliament, and with a uh, government uh, that uh, the government in power, the government of the day, having um, a lot of authority, uh, there's no one to balance uh, government uh, government decisions. So you have. Um, I'll just give you. I'll give you an example of uh, the re of how the reasonable clause has been used uh, in several years ago the government decided that uh, it needed to provide uh, bomb shelters for the communities that surround the Gaza Strip. Because there's constant <clears throat> back and forth between uh, Israel and Hamas. Mm -hmm. However, the government decided may, for budgetary reasons that only certain towns and maybe only certain neighborhoods were going to get uh, uh, funding for these bomb shelters. Or in, in many cases, they take um, uh, rooms or in, a, in your apartment and, and strengthen them uh, against uh, a missile attack. Well, many uh, residents who weren't going to receive this funding decided to appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, well, it's not reasonable that you only strengthen uh, the, uh, uh, the apartments or, or bomb, uh, build bomb shelters in some communities and not others. You need to have a more rational standard 
because obviously the government might say, well, uh, there's a mayor in this town who supports us, so we're going to um, we're going to build shelters for this particular town, but the, the neighboring town has a mayor that supports the opposition, so we're not going to be quite so forthcoming. The court said, no, it's reasonable. If you're going to do this, do it fairly and do it across the board. And in other cases, uh, Kevin, because there's so much uh, division in Israeli society and uh, things get stuck, it takes <clears throat> takes the court to to intervene. So, for example, we have tens of thousands of African refugees uh, who live in Tel Aviv um, and uh, Tel Aviv Jaffa, and the government has been trying for years to get these refugees to leave, uh, and they do so by, um, for example, denying trying to deny health care or deny uh, education. And the court comes along and says, well, you can't do this. This is, this is unreasonable. It's against uh, basic human rights. Um, it's also, Israel, that's, we want to remind you, you've signed international treaties, and you have to abide by these international treaties uh, in the way that you treat, uh, you treat refugees. So the court, the court um, is now involved in a lot of controversial decisions, decisions that oftentimes uh, those who are very nationalistic and those who um, want uh, more, you might say, traditional Jewish uh, practice uh, implemented or to put into law, um, the, the, these communities um, find the court to be an impediment, for example, to Israeli um, uh, activities on the West, settlement activities on the West Bank, or uh, another example would be, uh, do ultra-Orthodox men have to serve, have to serve in the military? Right. The court has said for years you know, to the government, you have to uh, decide on this issue and you can't draft you know, uh, half the population or three quarters of the population and then have 25% uh, of the population exempt from, exempt from the draft. So um, there is a need for court reform, but at the same time, you have, uh, you have a number of uh, issues that are uh, important to the, uh, to the right wing in Israel and to the, to the Orthodox community, and uh, they see the court as an impediment to their agenda, and uh, this is why it's come, up. it's come up now, because we have an, a government that is very, very, very right wing. Uh, to the point that um, a good number of, of uh, members of the coalition uh, could only be described, described as extremist and some uh, have to be uh, labeled, and it's a fair label, as being racist. So now, you, you mentioned the word coalition. coalition. <laughs> Here in America, we basically have a two-party system. Uh, mm -hmm. Republican and Democrat. Over in Israel, you have a multi-party system, and coalitions mm -hmm. have to be built in order to get laws passed, reforms to be done. Um, I want to talk about now the opposition to what's happening uh, with the Supreme Court, and that's kind of causing the division right now in Israel. You have two sides yeah. par parting up and saying, no way are you touching the court, we like what they're doing, yet the, the, the right side the orthodox side says no we're doing just fine um yeah, we we do have coal we do have coalition governments mm -hmm. and uh because of a um boy it'd take a long time to uh <laughs> to, to, to unpack this for 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 americans but in the last five years we've had a huge amount of uh instability with virtually with uh, a, a general election uh, every year and uh, a lot of this has to do with the um, the person and uh, the personality of uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu. And in our last election, which took place uh, November, December of last year, you just had a huge number of, uh, of uh, voters who did not go to the polls uh, and it resulted in a uh, sweeping victory uh, for the right. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, to his credit, ran a very, very 
uh, good and tight uh, election campaign. However, uh, in order to secure uh, a very, um, you, you might say, sizable majority uh, and to build a coalition of like-minded people, he encouraged uh, quite a few extremists and quite a few uh, extremist groups uh, to merge together uh, and, uh, and to run. And these extremist groups um, certainly did uh, bring, in, uh, bring in the votes. And uh, now they have, uh, you might say, uh, imprisoned him, uh, and he he has to go along. Uh, he has to go along with their uh, their agenda. He uh, over his um, over the over the years, uh, although he is a nationalist, he's always been uh, someone who supports the rule of law, the independence of the court system. And, uh, and now the extremists in his own party and uh, those who are uh, super ultra nationalists, as well as the ultra orthodox, uh, more or less uh, told him, we want court reform. We want the courts to uh, uh, much of their independence to uh, be removed so that uh, nothing really stands in the way. Uh, of our, uh, our of our agenda. So here's the case of uh, uh, we have a political system again largely inherited uh, from pre-war Europe and perhaps Poland uh, in particular and uh, this political system uh, is not uh, serving the country very well. It has at times in the past but uh, in the times in which uh, in these days in which we live it's really been uh, really been a disaster. Now, would it be fair to say that the Middle East has been more peaceful over the last 10 years as a region? The, um, I would say, of course, you know, the, there are some very positive trends. And uh, at the same time, there are some, uh, uh, some things that are happening that are extremely dangerous. It, Israel has, has found some modus, uh, modus avendi uh, with the... Uh, Muslim, the Sunni Muslim world, and uh, its relations with uh, many Muslim countries, Sunni Muslim countries, is uh, actually pretty good, not bad. Uh, and th this is uh, somewhat encouraging. We have relations with, uh, 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 with the Gulf states. We uh, have um, common interests with countries like uh, Jordan, uh, and uh, Israel, even though the present government isn't very sensitive to uh, to the needs of those countries, but still, nonetheless, there are noises afoot that there could be uh, diplomatic relations, uh, even with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Today, Israeli Israeli aircraft uh, on their way to uh, India or to Thailand are allowed to fly over uh, Saudi Arabia. The um, Arab Sunni nations are very interested in Israeli technology, uh, you might say covert Israeli military help or inte uh, intelligence uh, cooperation, uh, and they have a common enemy. A common enemy is Iran. Right. Now, we'll, we will see uh, if, uh, if and when uh, the Iranian threat goes away. These relationships will remain. Uh, the negative trend, as I mentioned, is Iran. Iran uh, and their allies, Iran uh, and its presence in Lebanon, uh, Iran and its presence uh, in the Gulf, uh, Yemen rather, uh, Iran and its um, mischief making uh, in Gaza. Um, and this is, this is quite dangerous and uh, we could very well have end up with a, with a war uh, either between Israel and Iran or we can end up with a, a very possibly, and may, and may my words not reach God's ear, but very possibly a, a war between uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we have an ongoing daily war between Israel and Iran, uh, and Israel and Hezbollah in Syria. Every day, is, Israel is attacking Iranian targets and uh, Hezbollah targets in Syria itself. So, I find I find the the relationship with Egypt to be amazing. 
Mm -hmm. You know, a lot has changed there over the years. A lot has changed there, but still, you have, you still have a, uh, a hesitancy um, on the part of Arab states to fully, fully engage and to fully reconcile with Israel. They have diplomatic mm -hmm. relations, with trade relations. Uh, these countries want Israeli technology. They want Israeli intelligence help, but they're afraid of Israel culturally. They're afraid of, um, uh, you might say, Israeli influence. They, they don't want to, um, um, you might say, fully have uh, normal, normal, friendly, uh, friendly relations. Uh, might be more the case, for example, between Morocco and Israel. Um, but Egypt is still, uh, still a bit cold. But as uh, it is often repeated here, better a cold peace than a hot war. You mentioned cold. Here in America, we were most patriotic and unified when the Cold War existed, when there was an mm -hmm. Iron Curtain, when there was a common en enemy in, in Russia and the, mm -hmm. the great Satan, so to speak. That's, right. that's gone. That's washed away. And so America has lost its focus. What's causing Israel to lose, lose its focus as a nation? Um, I, and in part, it's the these internal contradictions, right, uh, within the society. I don't think that people have lost their focus or lost their passion. Um, I think there's a great deal of patriotism here, a uh, great deal of uh, love of country. And uh, you can see it, uh, for example, in uh, the way that uh, the secular population, who has been fairly united uh, against the court reforms and the activities of uh, this current government. Uh, they, the protests, very large and you might say impressive, um, they wrap themselves in the Israeli flag. They sing, they sing the national anthem. They are fighting uh, for, the, for the, soul of, uh, the soul of the country. That's how, that's how they see it. And, uh, you know, for an American um, where patriotism is not uh, a very important value for most young people, uh, it's, it's refreshing to see. And the, the patriotism is on the left because uh, we don't normally think of people who are left wing uh, as being patriotic. But the patriotism mm -hmm. is on the left. The patriotism uh, can be found uh, on the right. And uh, people are just very passionate about the, the, you know, the future of Israel. There's only one Israel. It's fragile. It's been successful, uh, but its future is not, you know, necessarily uh, guaranteed. And uh, the uh, different Jewish groups have uh, been, uh, you might say, battling this out in the media. Uh, in the culture, on the streets, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have a, our situation is uh, is a little uh, is certainly uh, a little different here. Um, and the in the United States, we're suffering from amnesia. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, here, 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 we we're not we we a memory and uh, being connected, remaining connected to the past. We're trying to learn from the past. Uh, is uh, is a very very important uh, Jewish value. Uh, so, yeah, and that's true. I'm here in America, uh, we spent a, a generation and a half teaching our children that they don't need to love America, and that there's mm -hmm. not a lot to love about America, and that mm -hmm. we should be divided by our races and divided by uh, so many things that it was very easy to reintroduce or introduce for the first time Marxism and wokeism into uh, the American uh, education system and, and polity here. Uh, right. I don't see that so much in Israel. I see a, a, a different, and I'm going to use the word, maybe future civil war happening. Uh, God forbid. It's God not forbid. It's certainly, certainly yeah. not impossible. And uh, it's happened before uh, in uh, Jewish history. Um, and uh, it, ex it especially uh, is dangerous in any country, not just Israel, when you have a certain extremism, whether it's the left or the right, and uh, you have political or religious ideologies that say 
uh, we've got the silver bullet. We can solve all of the problems, you know, mm-hmm. at once. We are, <clears throat> you know, people will just do things our way, and we'll have to use force. And, and nobody but, will die. <laughs> uh, and yes, and some people may uh, die, although that, that idea is pretty abhorrent here. Uh, at least it is now, and I hope it remains uh, remains so. Yes, you know we we uh, we know the right way, and we're going to uh, we're going to uh, impose it upon you. And that kind of that kind of extremism, or that kind of populism that's born out of frustration, right? You know the system doesn't work. You know we're we're getting shafted. Our group, our 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 race, our ethnic group, whatever you call it, and uh, you know there are no shortcuts. And every anybody who proposes uh, a shortcut or a one simple easy solution, uh, you're we're asking for trouble. And whether it's in Israel or Poland before the war or the United States, the minute you we start to demonize, oh, it's all our problems are because of the leftists. All our problems are because of the judges. All our problems are. This is, a, I think, a recipe, a, a, a recipe for uh, for trouble. Um, it could be, you know, the press or the media, uh, or the IRS or the Justice Department. It could be problematic. We're not uh, suggesting uh, any such thing, but uh, we need uh, we need patience. And uh, I'm always reminded of Jesus who talks about how this change comes. It comes sometimes very slowly, and it has to come through uh, personal transformation and conversion uh, and more. And sometimes it uh, really can't be imposed from the top because the minute you impose it from the top on people, whether it's Marxism or, you know, populism or Christian conservatism, the minute you impose it upon people, they will eventually throw it off. 69 years the Soviet Union was in existence. And 69 for 69 years, they murdered and imprisoned and starved people and the millions in order to maintain the system. And uh, given, you know, given the opportunity, people threw it off, right? They're still authoritarian, but the Marxist system, uh, the Marxist system is gone. And people will do that uh with any political system or any religious ideology unless so, unless unless there's a conversion unless yes. there unless there is uh, people buy into it and uh well i i'm reading reports uh from the jerusalem uh post and other places that there is uh not a great amount but a limited amount of christian persecution happening in the borders of israel yeah uh, yeah, uh, although I wouldn't use the word persecution, I would say that there, uh, at the moment, there is a has been an upswing of uh, of harassment, uh, especially in the uh, Jerusalem uh, area, and uh, this sort this sort of harassment or uh, a certain hostility uh, towards Christianity, and we can thank here uh, the long history of anti-Semitism. Uh, this has been on the upswing because the, uh, you might say, the extremists or those who, uh, again, and I want to emphasize it's a pretty small minority, but uh, those who have something of a score, you might say, to settle with historic uh, Christianity uh, feel emboldened. Uh, and they feel as if uh, uh, their sympathizers are uh, now in the government and uh, they will be protected, yes, and this uh, activity, spitting on clergymen, uh, spitting on nuns, spitting on churches, uh, vandalizing uh, churches, and in some cases, um, setting churches on fire or or other Christian institutions. Um, Same time, Protestant institutions have uh, something of 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 a different uh, of a different issue and harassment takes a, a different form. Uh, but yes, there has been a, a, a definite noticeable uh, uptick in uh, this kind of activity. Including Christchurch? Uh, Christchurch, um, a little bit less so, thanks to the fact that we're across from the police station. 
and uh, we're something of a closed compound. But yes, we have uh, spitting, um, we many threats of verbal violence, and people regularly tell tell us they're going to uh, burn us down or they're going to uh, uh, destroy us. Uh, and uh, we should just wait. And then we have other forms of harassment. Uh, we we have um, Jewish groups who um, uh, who've uh, dedicated themselves to uh, ensuring uh, no Jews become Christians, or Jews don't visit Christian institutions, sure. or yeah. Jews aren't somehow influenced by Christian in institutions. So we're constantly. Um, uh, we're constantly receiving people who say they want to convert or or who are recording our conversations or trying to uh, sometimes influence the government, uh, uh, you know, to make decisions against us. So um, there are different, uh, different forms of harassment. And uh, this harassment, again, is carried out by a minority. Uh, but of course, uh, it worries the Christian community and it is uh, humiliating, yes, to, to be spat upon uh, or to, to have your church vandalized uh, uh, with uh, slogans uh, that are blasphemous, especially against, uh, against Jesus. Yeah. All right. So I just want to talk a little bit about the tourism dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. If... Christians are being persecuted and Christians from around the world come to visit Jerusalem um, and the old city. Um, do they not understand there's a long, long and short term economic ramifications by uh, attacking Christians? Well, I'll tell you that uh, most people in Israel, they understand that the, the ones who run tours and uh, those who, for example, uh, involved uh, in, banking or high tech uh, these folks are very <clears throat> very not very rational and they by the way very uh sympathetic to uh what's happening uh to the christian community the christian community here is very small very tiny so so let me point out to you that uh, in a city of a million jerusalem virtually one million people there might be twenty thousand christians okay so i most people uh unlike those who watch Anglican TV, don't get up every morning and <clears throat> think about the state of the church or the, you know, the, the latest uh, Anglican politics uh, or, you know, uh, about Christianity in general, right? It's just, mm -hmm. oh, it's there. It's interesting. We have a few Christians in, in, uh, in Israel, and generally we have a lot of, uh, we have rights and protection under the law. Although who knows if that will continue with the after the uh, after the court reforms, so yes, there are people here who recognize uh, this is bad for Israel's tourism. This is bad for Israel's international reputation, and there are a lot of Jewish people say this is not who we are. I mean, we we have had a history of persecution and oppression uh, from the Christian world uh, and from others. We're not about to try to settle scores. We're not living in the 13th century anymore. Or we're not in the middle of the, uh, you know, of, of the Holocaust. Uh, we don't want to live in a, uh, we don't want to live in a society uh, like this. And these are uh, folks who've been uh, very sympathetic and in many cases have been appalled and even, uh, even very helpful. Um, so again, you have a, uh, sort of, a, you have a minority, some are ultra-nationalists, some are ultra-orthodox, um, and uh, they uh, feel like this is the season now for um, some sort of readjustment of the relationship. And I can, I want to say one other thing, so it makes the context a little clearer. Um, it's not simply that you have an extremist government that has ministers in that, uh, in this government that uh, will show some uh, show sympathy uh, to acts of extremism, whether it's here inside Israel or uh, in the West Bank. You also have a, uh, something uh, larger going on, and that is uh, since uh, the Second World War, there has been a uh, 
rapprochement. There's been, you might say, a, something of a reconciliation between Jews and Christians. There is a greater understanding between, thankfully, between Jews and Christians. A lot of the borders and the hostility uh, are starting to subside and come down. We can now talk about the things we, we have in common, uh, not just about the differences in our faith. And as the, you might say, the separation and the distinction uh, starts to, to, get, to get lower, to, to, to be less noticeable, this makes some people, Jews and Christians, nervous. Okay. Uh, and there are those in our community and those certainly in the Jewish community who want to keep the walls high to keep make sure that there's separation because this leads to no confusion in identity uh, or you, it does means you're not going to have a, a mixing of, of, of any kind and uh, there's a tendency with some Jewish groups who, who want to keep Jews as separate as possible from the world and the ideologies of the world and Christianity and especially liberal Christianity um, is considered uh, to be a very bad influence here in Israel. I think people would be surprised by who lives inside the borders of Israel. Mm -hmm. It's not just Jews. It's not just exactly. Israelites. It's not just uh, Christians. Uh -huh. You you have a, a I would not going to say a vast, but certainly a populace of other religions within Israel. Now we we uh, the country is about eighty percent Jewish or maybe slightly less um, is uh, we have a very large uh, Sunni Muslim minority uh, especially uh, in, in the Galilee uh, and uh, amongst those groups we have Bedouins and uh, gypsies we, we have Druze and Circassians uh, of course all kinds of different kinds all, all sorts of uh, Christian groups uh, although, on the whole, Christians only make up 2%, uh, if not less, of uh, Israeli society. But because the Christian population is very wealthy and very well-educated, uh, it certainly uh, punches, you might say, uh, above, its, uh, above its weight. Mm -hmm. We have um, many uh, uh, immigrants who, uh, who came, especially from the former Soviet Union, who, who live in Israel, who uh, say they have no religion, meaning they're not technically Jewish and they're not technically Christian. Um, so yes, we have, uh, we have quite a mix. And uh, for some people, that's very rich and exciting. And for others, uh, it's uh, a source of anxiety, right? If you, yes, if you want a Jewish state, the fact that there's so many non-Jews or perhaps different types of Jews that practice a type of Judaism that isn't exactly traditional or orthodox, well, that creates kind of, that creates a, a worry uh, and, a, and an anxiety that, um, again, expresses itself in, uh, you know, in different ways, maybe in racism or in uh, the desire to want it not to, to shun the minority or not to get to know them. Uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, this is the, the reality in, in which we live. I think it makes the country kind of exciting and dynamic, but others don't share that view. All right, well, let's just finish up and talk about what racism looks in Israel. What does it look like in, in Israel? <clears throat> we talked about it a couple times in, you know, early on in our conversation, but I kind of want to finish up with this because it's important. Uh -huh. it, it, right, it is important, and again, uh, as I said in uh, in the beginning, I, I'm, I, I realize that uh, racism uh, in some uh, some context has been uh, abused, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, has been used uh, maliciously for for one political purpose or another, or for financial gain. But here we 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 have a problem. Uh, the courts and others have uh, recognized that problem. Many educational institutions uh, <clears throat> recognize uh, the, the problem that we have. Uh, it is being dealt with uh, successfully and uh, in a number of institutions such as the, the, the Israeli army where um, 
there, there is no racism. Um, however, you have, um, and let me start with this, you have, a, uh, you might say, a prejudice or a racism that comes uh, from Jews and Arabs, and it is based on something that we don't have in the United States. And that is, you might have an Israeli clerk who is dealing uh, with uh, some kind of uh, uh, paperwork or some kind of request from Muslim Arabs you know, who are citizens of Israel. And the clerk is, can say to himself or herself, you know, 20 years ago, an Arab terrorist killed my brother. Right. I don't like these people. So in part, you have to understand that this is based on, uh, for both communities, right, on a... Uh, on a long history of violence in which uh, families have been, people have been killed and, uh, and traumatized, uh, yes, and there's this, there's this fear. There's well, also... I, 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 I want to be clear, the conflict in some regards still exists. No, the, con the, conflict, the conflicts absolutely still resist, mm -hmm. uh, still exist, mm -hmm. and uh, in some ways, and, and at least... Uh, in the last year in the West Bank, uh, it, it, has, uh, it has gotten worse uh, because you have, uh, uh, you have ongoing terrorism mm -hmm. and the way that uh, many of the Jewish extremists have, um, have reacted is to engage in Jewish terrorism right. against Palestinians, uh, which has uh, been, uh, it's always been some of that, but there's never been so much of that. Um, as we uh, as we see now, and it's very worrying, uh, and it's and it's fueling even more Palestinian, uh, even more Palestinian terrorism. Uh, but again, there is again, there's a you have trauma uh, in both uh, in both populations. You you have um, racism uh, often in. I don't want an Arab living next to me. I don't want uh, Arabs to receive government funds. Um, the, I don't want to deal with the pro. I just, you know, maybe the Arabs work in my factory, but I'm not going to make friends with them because we will always be enemies. Or it's better that we keep them out of society. It's better that they remain uh, second-class citizens. And of course, Arabs, Arab citizens of Israel can can be racist and hostile uh, towards the, the Jewish majority. It's not uh, simply uh, a one-way street. But there are some really positive things happening. Uh, in Israeli hospitals, you find more and more Arab doctors. Uh, on Israeli football teams, you have more and more, uh, you know, uh, stars, uh, football, uh, foot soccer stars who, uh, who are playing for Israel even uh, internationally, you have uh, Arabs who've been brought into the Arab engineers and computer scientists who are brought into the high tech. Uh, virtually every pharmacy in Israel now has an Arab pharmacist. You do have a lot of uh, Arabs who want to go to is Israeli universities and Israeli um, colleges. They learning Hebrew, and they want to inter uh, integrate into. Uh, Israeli society and have a piece of the, you might say, the, the Israeli pie. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, these are the positive trends, but at the, at the same time, uh, there are some, uh, there are certainly some, uh, there's still negative uh, tr trends. Excuse me. It's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, hi. Uh, say hi to Kevin. Hello. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Kevin. I think your shoes, your shoes, uh, your shoes are outside on the table. I heard you burnt your hand last night. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your hand. So, uh, you know what? Papa will be done in a minute, and uh, we can do something together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Can Can you wait? You, you wait a minute. Okay. Your shoes. Uh, Deborah is close. His wet clothes are in, uh, are in our bathroom, or his shoes are outside on the table. Okay. 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 Uh, wait, wait, wait. Shut. Can you shut the door for me? 
Sorry about that. <laughs> oh no, that's why we have edit buttons. No big deal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah racism. Why, why, why you have this integration? You have this integration today, yeah. or just yes, yesterday. Uh, you had our finance minister, who, again, who is uh, well noted for his uh, very extremist anti-Arab views, uh, including uh, he recently suggested that one Palestinian town should be burnt to the ground after a resident of that town um, attacked uh, and killed Jewish motorists. Uh, our finance minister um, just uh, froze uh, funds that were set aside to help uh, local Arabs in Jerusalem integrate into Israeli universities by giving them uh, uh, language lessons and enabling them to um, uh, prepare themselves uh, academically uh, to enter um, Israeli uh, technical colleges and, and universities. And his excuse was very flimsy and uh, against the advice of uh, the uh, security officials uh, and more. Uh, basically, he wants to freeze out uh, the Arab minority uh, even though uh, probably most people in Israel, even if they sometimes have their hesitation, would rather bring that minority close and uh, integrate them uh, fully into the society. Here in America, we can identify our politics by age, where you are in your mm -hmm. age. The youth are mm -hmm. very liberal. The older, uh, above 35, are conservative. Is that right. the same in Israel? No. Uh, that is not that, that is not the same in Israel because we have uh, we have quite a few uh, young people uh, who would be uh, involved in the nationalist uh, camp. Uh, many are uh, are conservative. Uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, there are many there are many young people who we would pr perhaps call call leftist. But it, it, again, it's a very very um, a tricky category here to to use uh, our understanding of what is left wing and sure. what is what is right wing. So, just a you know, very interesting example. The, the so called left in Israel is probably the most pro capitalist and pro business, um, and uh, they want uh, yeah. Uh, F uh, free trade. They want less government restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, they they want to flourish, and you have many um, you have many who are in the nationalist camp, and we would consider them by American standards. We would, on the surface, at least, oh, they're right wing, and and they're basically supporters of of uh, government largesse, government handouts. Um, you might say, uh, kind of a ultra orthodox uh, form of. Of socialism, uh, we we want uh, support for seminary studies. Uh, we don't want to uh, w uh, work in full time. We don't want a full time occupation, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. So again, it's 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 <laughs> you know if I, I don't know if most of your viewers around the world or or in the United States uh, if they want you know to to delve into this, but uh, if they don't, they should just. Uh, simply say, uh, if I'm not going to study the uh, study it somewhat, then perhaps I'll just withhold. I'll just withhold uh, judgment. Okay. <sighs> well, according to YouTube, ninety six percent of my viewers are Christian, and we mm -hmm. often engage them in prayer and ask them to pray for things. How could I ask my viewers to pray for Jerusalem and Israel? Well, I, I think pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I think this is uh, important. I th think, as you said in the beginning, it has uh, uh, worldwide uh, implications. I believe uh, that Paul makes, I believe, the argument in part that's made in Romans 11 that uh, the, there is a mysterious uh, yet a um, undeniable connection between uh, the church uh, and the Jewish people. Yeah, uh, there's a mutuality and there's an independence. And uh, I can't give you all the details because Paul doesn't spell it out there. Uh, so we want to pray, uh, pray for uh, the peace, uh, peace in Jerusalem. We want to pray for the well-being uh, of the Jewish people. 
Um, we want to pray that there'll be re real reconciliation and not just living side by side uh, here uh, in Jerusalem and throughout Israel and certainly uh, in the Middle East. So I would encourage, I would uh, just encourage uh, folks to pray and those who really feel a burden to, to pray in a serious way that they spend time, uh, you, you know, educating themselves and then going before the Lord and asking the Lord to uh, to show them, you know, how to pray in a in a, in a very specific uh, specific way. Uh, it's great that we pray every Sunday for world peace or for peace in our time, um, but I think the intercessions, uh, the the Sunday intercessions, uh, are only a reminder of what we should be doing in our prayer closet um, and. Uh, coming before the Lord and uh, again, praying in the way that he leads or he directs. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm Kevin thank Coulson, you. and I've been here with David Poligli talking about politics, religion, and hopefully not a future civil war in Israel. Uh, from your mouth to God's ear, Kevin.